We have often reported on food insecurity. It is, after all, part of the mandate of farmers and ranchers to get their goods all the way to tables of Americans across the nation. This week, we look back at food insecurity again. Much of that discussion started with COVID in March of 2020 and a massive disruption of the food supply chain. Supply chain can mean a lot of things, but what it typically refers to is the groups of people or companies or organizations that take things from raw materials and transform them, move them from one place to another, and turn them into something else. There's no such thing as one single supply chain because they tend to be unique to each kind of product, each kind of customer need, and each group of people that are putting them together. If we're talking about agricultural products, that might wind up meaning a can of beans, including the tin can wrapped around it, or it might also mean frozen products for a grocery store. Supply chains can be very fragile. People often think in terms of supply chain failures, especially being like a stack of dominoes. One falls and the next one comes down behind it. You might have dominoes begin to fall in one place. They hit a point where the supply chain share a common member and suddenly it begins to create failures in multiple different supply chains, some not even related to the supply chain that began to fail. Most of us don't notice the distribution system, the supply chains around us. I mean, they are all around us. I mean, it's like the force, right? <laughs> Everywhere around us making life possible. We never know it's there until it stumbles. And then we can see it vividly. My name's Ethan Wolford. I'm 29 years old. And I own a USDA processing plant in Loosedale, Mississippi. And I basically service farmers in the local area in the region to help them turn their livestock into meat that they can sell at restaurants, grocery stores, and farmers markets. More people are getting off of, of industrial food chain beef that comes from uh, the five packing houses in the Midwest, and, and they're relying more on their local source of meat. A lot of times farmers will bring a cow in and half of it's going back to their family and the other half is going to their in-laws or going to their grandchildren. And they do that every year. It's part of their culture, it's part of their, their heritage. They, they grow up and they eat meat solely from things that they raise themselves, animals they raise themselves. So the meat, livestock, specifically think about the beef cattle supply chain. It starts off with the cattle being produced in the pasture uh, and then it, it moves through this really complicated but connected process to ultimately get to where it's beef on the consumer's plate. So in Mississippi, 
uh, generally starts out in cow-calf operations. These are producers who are uh, raising mama cows and those cows have calves. The next stage, it generally goes to some kind of stalker operation. Uh, and that stage is where it brings a lot of the calves together. Uh, and then from the stalker operation, it goes to uh, what we call feedlots. From there, they're fed for a period of time for probably 120 days or more. Uh, and then at that point, they are ready to actually be processed and turned into beef. And it's really at that processing stage where we saw the disruption mostly last year or primarily last year. When the coronavirus hit in March, it wasn't until about June that we started seeing the actual effects on our business. When June hit, the packing houses closed down in the Midwest and that cut the supply of beef off to the rest of the country. Because of that disruption, there were supply concerns on beef and so the markets responded with higher prices. That's how markets ration supplies. It went so high to the fact that most, most of my local farmers were selling meat that was cheaper than what you can get at the grocery store if you could actually get meat at the grocery store. A lot of times you just couldn't get it. So then you have these cattle producers who are saying, okay, well, you know, can I look for other alternatives? Is there any way that I can process my own beef and sell the beef versus, you know, accepting the lower prices? So they're now turning their cows and they're going to process local processors. And that's why we're getting so booked out is because everyone is basically getting a cow butchered because they were a, scared that, hey, I don't know if beef prices are going to shoot back up again. Let's just keep it safe and let's fill a freezer up something with, with meat of, of cows that we own. And uh, everybody and their mother did that. And it was, and we've been booked out for 12 months for the past six months. People, they had a cow, they wanted to feed their family, but they couldn't get it processed because they couldn't get on my schedule. And that was the sense where I felt, a lot of farmers felt this, what a, ca a sea captain would feel when they're, they're all thirsting to death, or the, there's, there's water everywhere in this ocean, but none of them could drink it. And it's what it felt like when you're in the midst of a herd of cattle, but you can't get beef. I started then realizing that there's, there was a food crisis here in Loosedale. There was a, a way, an access to meat problem. And I was thinking, in what way can I make a difference in my community? And I kind of saw like beef as a kind of a, a currency of sorts, where I was like, I don't have a lot of US dollars, but I've got a lot of meat. Let's see if I can't shake and move and change my environment around me with just using this. The moment I recognized that, that thought coming in that I can do something, I just went with it. I had a unique position and a unique opportunity to actually take an animal and get a lot of meat off of it for little to no cost to me. What do I want to do with that gift? Oh, uh, let's have a blast. Let's give it away. I thought it was going to be a little bit easier to give away ground beef but it was actually a little bit more tricky than I thought. It was just, you know, kind of standing out in the heat and loose still, kind of bark, carnival barking, trying to get people to, to not be afraid of someone who's offering them free ground beef because no one ever does that. So it's kind of a weird thing to be like, are you sure you're giving away beef? Why are you giving away beef? Is, that, is there something wrong with this beef? I'm like, no, it's not a trick or a gimmick. It is just, uh, Unadulterated free beef. <laughs> really good, locally sourced. I think you'll enjoy it. Take it to your mama, free beef. But it was fun. When we did have interactions, when people did come and see that it wasn't a gimmick and there was no strings attached, that, that you really could take this, they, they, they just were ineffable sometimes. They, they didn't believe it. They were like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah. 
Beef. It's grass-fed ground beef from here from uh, Joe Haver out there at uh, Rolling Hills Ranch. Oh, yeah. yeah, you want one pack for free. If you promise to give away a pack, I'll give you another pack if you, if you want to give it away okay. to somebody. You got somebody yeah. to give it away to? There you go, man. Thanks. The deal was I give you one pack for free, but if you, if you have other people that you can interact with, if you can give this other pack of ground beef to them, then I'll give you more. And so I would ask them, I was like, here, you get this one for free, but if you know, if you know anybody, and they all know something, they're like, yeah, my mother-in-law, or I'm going to see my mom today, or I'm going to see my grandchildren today, they would love this. And you not only made a connection with that person in front of you, but you then gave an opportunity to that person in front of you to, to practice altruism. And it, it was really awesome to see that. And so you're, you're seeing people, days being made, but also knowing that that ripple effect is going on somewhere in the, in the community um, was, was really fulfilling. You know, giving it freely to anybody who came up was top priority for me. Anyone who wanted it could get it. It was available to everybody. They just, they didn't have to ask for it. I tried, I tried to put it in their pockets. <laughs> and so uh, that was, I think that was the best course of action because you don't know who's food and secure. A unique solution to a food crisis, at least in part, give the food away. Next week, we'll have the conclusion to The Hungry Estate with two more parts of this compelling and Emmy-winning story.